everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts that we call Menninger Mindscape. Delighted to have a guest today, Dr. John Rush. And many of you may know his name because he's really one of the leaders in the field as a researcher and a clinician and has really contributed to our understanding of lots of things in the big picture of the mood disorders, but especially depression. John was at the University of Texas in Southwestern in Dallas for quite some time. Uh, he then did a very interesting thing more recently and um, decided to see different part of the world. So he was and is now an emeritus professor at Duke NUS, which stands for the National University of Singapore. And John was located there. So what I really want to talk about is the STAR-D study that you were the lead uh, investigator for, and it's been so important, so I want you to tell us about that. But take a second and tell us how you got to Singapore. Singapore was um, a wonderful adventure, thanks to Ranga Krishnan, and a friend of mine who became the dean of the school, and he kept saying, come to Singapore and we can do new things in medical education and developing researchers, uh, because it was a, a medical school starting up. So it's reorganized differently, the medical students are taught differently, and I think some of the innovations will be coming back to the U.S. So it's a great five years, and wouldn't mind being over there for another five years. Yeah, it was well, a lot of fun. I bet that was really an adventure in all kinds of ways. It was. But we're glad to have you back. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for having me. So our viewers may not know much about STAR-D and may not even know what it stands for. So just give us the, the, the bottom line kind of summary, because uh, I think it's really important for us to know about. Sure. So the big picture is this was a contract, a competitive contract to, uh, to us from the National Institute of Mental Health, sequence treatment alternatives to relieve depression. And the primary question that we were challenged to design and evaluate was what do you do if the first treatment for depression doesn't work? So it wound up being a multi-stage, multi-site, multi-year, uh, multi-million dollar uh, extravaganza, a large study that produced 140 papers and so on from which we learned, I think, a great deal to help clinicians and patients understand and set their expectations for what might happen when you receive routine treatment for depression under, I would say, very carefully guided circumstances. So in short, we started with a single drug, doesn't matter which one, it would happen to be an SSRI, and we asked and the question- Just to interrupt for the viewers, that's a- that's an Selected, antidepressant. An antidepressant, one of, uh, of the class of antidepressants, relatively new ones, around since 1988. And we asked the question, um, how many people get into remission after 12 weeks of treatment? And we also asked, how many weeks does it take to get into remission? And the answer was about 35% get into remission, and you shouldn't stop treatment, even if it's only working somewhat, till at least eight weeks. And thirdly, we wound up uh, using what we called something we called measurement-based care. So we're measuring symptoms and side effects literally at every visit so that we're ensuring that the dose goes up as, as well as it can be tolerated. And the reason for that is if you underdose, you wind up with a modest but insufficient benefit. So that was our first set of findings. And then we well, said... Well, before you go any further, sure. I mean, that contained for a lot of people a surprise. Yes. And the surprise was the 35%. These are medications that are thought to be the, the treatment of choice for this condition, and it's widely viewed as a treatable condition for the most part. Right. So. And, and, and actually, uh, our findings fit the FDA randomized controlled trials, which actually find about a 50% response rate, of which most, 35% of the initial sample, uh, actually hit remission. So we found what people should have been expecting. But it wasn't a 70% uh, home run rate. We got home runs in about 35, maybe 40%. And we got doubles and triples in another 15%. And then about a little around half just didn't get uh, to first base. And that means they needed another treatment. So what we did the next step was to say, OK, if you're not in remission, we didn't take response. And parenthetically, the reason we didn't take response as an outcome is because we already knew and our study showed in spades that if you wind up with only a response, which is good, the patient says, I'm better, and the doctor says, we're out of the woods. And, and just define a little bit what you mean by response and remission. OK, so, so, so response is a, a clinically meaningful reduction in symptoms, usually framed as around 50%. Mm -hmm. Remission is virtually no symptoms. The depression is gone. And the difference is when the patient, you ask the patient, how are you doing? They're remitted. They say, I'm back to normal. Mm -hmm. And when you say, how are you doing there? It's a response. They say, well, I'm better. 
and you don't hear the. Right. Okay. okay. So, so our aim is remission because people who have response without remission relapse at about twice the rate as people with remission. And we show that very dramatically at every single stage of this uh, study. So it was suspected to be true, and now it's proven that the only way to go is remission. Well, that's an important finding. That's, that's a hugely important, important finding, yeah. exactly. Okay, so now we're, into, now we're into the question we're supposed to do the contract for, which right. is what do you do if the first treatment doesn't work? Right. So we randomized those who did not hit remission who would be willing to do it, because it was all informed consent, of course, to an open trial of three different new medications switching or three different augmenting methodologies. Two were medicine, one was therapy. Okay. And we also allowed switching into therapy itself from the medication. So we had seven options at the second level, since so the large study. Mm -hmm. The findings there were, the good news was we had a meaningful uh, overall remission rate. Another 25% of those who entered that hit remission, mm -hmm. the high standard. Mm -hmm. The a uh, confusing result was it didn't matter which medication you got switched to, and it didn't matter which medication you got augmented with, and the therapies looked as good as the medications, although the sample sizes were smaller. So it's staying in treatment and doing the treatment well being more important than which treatment you happen to get for the second step. Yeah, that's so interesting because there are a lot of studies comparing one form of psychotherapy with another for conditions like depression, but right. other conditions as well. And more often than not, it won't be clear that one is a clear winner in the horse race compared to another. It has that's more right. to do with sticking with treatment, developing a good relationship with a therapist, continuing to work over enough time to make a difference. Um, right. The therapy is important. Um, but it's interesting that that's a way you can think about medication interchangeability in a sense as well. Exactly, and, and it's not unlikely that during the treatment with medication, patients are learning things. Learning things are therapy. So it could be the medication helps a person learn things better and faster. Well, well and there's all that debate out there in the world about the placebo response and how high it is in treatment of depression. Well, it is high, except that most often it's not a placebo. It's a supportive, caring environment and people interested in somebody and paying attention. And the patient who's in a placebo control trial who is going to take action when it comes to dealing with their problem mm -hmm. for which they showed up and got into the right. treatment to begin with. So the next quick steps, uh, to be brief, is the third step and the fourth step. So these are those that didn't hit remission after mm -hmm. the second step, got randomized to different switching and augmenting methodologies. And now we have a return on investment. The remission rate is 15, 1.5% in the third step, and about the same in the fourth step. Mm -hmm. So you have a 35 or 40% right. down to about 25% in the second and 15% in each of the subsequent. So cumulatively, we were able to put, if no one dropped out, about 68% of patients would have hit remission. The problem is the dropout rate because depressed people get, like everybody else, discouraged. discouraged yeah. And you know, if you don't see a return on your investment, you sell and move on. And that, so another message I think for patients and doctors is don't give up. Even though the return on investment is smaller as you go on, one out of seven is a chance to get into remission is awfully good. And it one sure out is. of, you know, four out of 10 is, I think, quite good. So it isn't that we can cure everybody, and of course there are many other treatments now for depression, so not just the, th the treatments we study. But I think that the diligent care, aiming for remission, measuring things as you go along, not giving up in the middle of things, and being willing to switch when you're very certain that the first or second or even the third treatment doesn't work, that are all good principles of care, and any general medical problem would be the same, really. And it's really a good news story. Um, it's a good yeah. news story. But, it is, but, but it's it also... it takes work and time and effort and sticking, sticking with it. You got it. Yeah. I think the other nice thing is it opened up a whole lot of research questions. So are there ways to you know, create biomarkers? Can we identify which patients for which treatments? And this, of course, as you know, some of the work going on here and elsewhere, well, all right. you're trying to actually fit the treatment to the person in a personalized, more efficient a way to give Absolutely. a better outcome. Absolutely, and we get lots of patients here who would be in the category of having treatment-resistant depression because it just hasn't responded to treatment uh, yeah. out there in the world for all kinds of reasons. 
We also do things that would be, I, I don't know if this was part of the study, I don't think so, um, but looking at whether there's a hypermetabolism or a poor absorption, so looking at pharmacogenomics and trying to see if there are other factors that are part of explaining that layer that doesn't respond even with enough time and enough added treatment. Right, that wasn't part of STAR-D, but I th think STAR-D by identifying, let's say, a third of the patients mm -hmm. who even after four treatments we can't, cannot get into remission, these are patients who need uh, a very careful evaluation, I'd say even after two carefully done mm -hmm. treatments. Yeah. But there's a place to go, so you can Absolutely. start with um, a very solid effort, and we know now a whole lot more than before this study in terms of rigorous methodology and have an expectation that can guide us and also guide us not to give up Absolutely. and to keep trying and help patients understand that there's an evidence base for this. It's not just because I say so as, as, as the clinician. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, we could keep talking, John, but this is a very, very wonderful contribution to all of us. I, I think it's just a heroic study. These are hard to do. It took an enormous, enormous amount of time, big team, um, and lots of volunteer patients who participated. Well, especially the patients who volunteered and, and their families who, without them, we can't do clinical research. But it, it's been a privilege to be able to do that and uh, make some small contribution to the benefit of the patients. Yes, indeed. I would not call it small. Yeah, I would. So thank you, John. Really great to have you here, and thank it's you. great to hear about that. Good to see you. And thank you all for joining us once again, and we'll see you next time.